You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of foxes. A dimension of otters. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both writing and fiction. Of things and ideas you've just crossed over into the Unsheathed Zone. Hi, welcome to Unsheathed Episode 14. The horror of erotic furry writing. Horror. Horror. I'm uh, Kyle Gold. I'm Kim Hirasaki. And uh, I'm, I'm the uh, well-lubricated Kyle Gold on this podcast. I have three drinks sitting here next to me. The remnants of a Coke Zero, a little bit of sweet dessert wine, and a glass of water. I was going to say that you're actually more well-lubricated than the podcast Otter, which is unusual. But I think about how much I have had to drink, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm just having my drinks in parallel. You had yours in cereal. Yeah, and the podcast wine tonight is actually really good. I should say uh, it is a sweet dessert wine, which is why I'm also partaking of it. It's it's it's, it's complex, though. It's not cloying. No, that's yeah. <laughs> very true. Uh, but um, this is not uncorked. It is unsheathed, even though uh, Hirosaki-san's microphone is not unsheathed this time. It's not. It's very sheathy. It is. Um, I feel this, I'm looking down at it, I just want to nibble at it tenderly. Yeah, so if the otter goes all quiet in the middle of the podcast, y'all can picture in your imaginations what's going on there. I won't elaborate. Um, so we wanted to devote this episode to talking about horror, and about writing horror, and what tips we have, and what are some of our favorite horror stories. And I think it's actually good that we're doing it this week, and that we did have to push it back after last week. Because I ended up having a very hoary, uh, hoary. <laughs> I ended up having well, a, that too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there are stories I could tell you, but I won't. Um, That's all right. I think I already wrote one. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 one up on me on that. No, I was going to say that uh, I actually had a very horror tastic uh, weekend, so I'm actually in a much better horror mindset than I was. Horror is a really difficult word to say over and over again. Especially when you had three glasses of wine. No, it's, that's not it. I think it's just the R's. Well, and I think it's... Japanese people can't pronounce the letter R, right? You know that. That's true. I, I did know that. <laughs> Although I thought actually it was the letter L. Didn't they use lollipop as the code word in some of the Filipino bases in World War II? Oh, that's probably true. I would, so you I, should be able to say horror, but you couldn't say... Well, the other the other uh, trick word is uh, railroad. Oh yeah, you know in in uh, Swahili they confound the R and L sounds as well. It's um anyway, we're we're on all kinds of topics here, but um, Hakuna Matata, folks. Yeah. Uh, so do we want to start off just talking about some of our favorite horror stories, or do we want to jump right to the questions? Um, let's. Do a little bit of a genre talk first. All right. We can keep it brief. Um, I'm a big fan of Stephen King. A bunch of people are probably aware of that from some of my live journal posts and other places I've written. Um, Stephen King, I think, does horror in a particularly effective way because he writes such good characters. And again, I always come back to character. Um, he makes his people really believable, very sympathetic, and puts them in... And also, he has a, an incredible imagination for um, supernatural and horror settings and events. Yeah, and he's just actually really good with a lot of the in and outs of writing in general, almost on just an innate level. It's sort of He has a sort of inborn talent that I don't think a lot of people can quite match. He makes it seem so easy. If I'm allowed to say that. Um, I think you certainly are. Uh, well, and it, <clears throat> it's also, he's he's really prolific, um, which is not necessarily relevant, except that he has a huge body of work out there. And even the books that I think are a little um, incomplete or unsatisfying, like, you know, we could reel off a few titles, have really good ideas behind them and have some really vivid imagery um, yeah, I'll, I'll support that. I, st I still think The Shining is probably my favorite of his books and has some really incredible stuff in it. And that is, um, 
brings me up to a point about horror that I wanted to talk about, which is that horror is usually something extreme, something not necessarily supernatural, but it often is because it's something sort of beyond the bounds of the world we know in a negative way. And I believe you could have um, horror based just on human actions, uh, serial killers and stuff like that. Um, what Stephen King does in The Shining is makes horror out of alcoholism. The whole addictive experience that uh, Jack Torrance goes through is basically a retelling of alcohol of a man succumbing to alcoholism. And he does have an alcoholic problem in the movie, or in the, I'm sorry, in the narrative of the book as well. But he puts in a lot of touches that, that mirror that. And one of the things that horror does is by blowing up common problems to some kind of extreme or um, bizarre world, it gives us kind of a way to deal with them. And it takes something familiar and makes it huge and frightening, which at the, which makes it a little a little further removed from us, so it's not as intimately close, and we can we can deal with it better. And I think that's something that applies to a lot of different writing genres and just almost her writing in general. But in that case, in the instances that you're talking about, I think that's definitely a. Uh, a good thing to examine as to why the techniques are working and what makes them that effective. Well, and one of my favorite books is uh, Rosemary's Baby. And that and The Stepford Wives were both written by Ira Levin, and I highly recommend them if you're looking for a good horror book. Uh, the movies I'm not such a fan of, but the books are amazing. And what they both tapped into was the change in roles of women in the 50s and 60s and how, you know, Rosemary's Baby is about, of course, a housewife in New York whose husband, unbeknownst to her, joins a satanic cult and prepares her to bear the coming of the Antichrist. Whether it's real or not, you don't really know throughout most of the book, but it's kind of the fact that the husband is going through this behind her back and betraying the trust that she had in him, that's the real horror of the book. Um, Stepford Wives is kind of the same thing. Everybody knows the basic premise. Um, The men want their wives to be more like perfect housewives. Um, And again, you don't know what the reality is. You just know that these women are changing when they come to this town. And it's, again, the betrayal of the husband as sort of a rebellion against the woman wanting to take more freedom onto herself. It's all taken to an extreme, but it's taken these questions that were coming up in society at the time and putting them into this kind of scary supernatural context. Right. And in in the case of Stepford Wives, I mean, that became so iconic that that's just a term that's in common speech nowadays, and everyone knows what you mean when you say that. Right. Um, you know, just as a brief aside, I used to always mix up Rosemary's baby and whatever happened to baby Jane. I don't know why. I've actually never seen the movie or, um, of baby Jane. I've seen, that I've seen Kathy Rosemary's Bates baby. In it, I think that's oh. an old one. That was Betty Davis. And, um, no, no, wait, I'm think no, that's the other one I'm getting confused with. <laughs> Damn it. Um, Kathy Bates was in Misery. I know she was in Misery, but no, there was a... Yeah, no. Anyway. Um, now I'm going to try to remember what this other Kathy Bates movie I'm thinking of is. Uh, you'll think about it. What other books do you have you read in horror that you enjoyed? You know, when it comes to reading horror, I've actually read embarrassingly little of Stephen King, certainly next to you. I mean, I've read some, but when I think about most of what I read, it was back during late elementary and you know middle school high school i don't think i've read anything of his since i was a teenager so that's the funny thing because i never liked horror when i was growing up and it wasn't until like my senior year in high school that i started getting into it um 
I think because I didn't yeah. I didn't like to be scared. So I still don't like to be scared. I think part of the allure when I was younger was that it was sort of forbidden because it was more like grown up themes and you could read books where people get butchered and stuff like that where that was sort of where that came from. Huh. Uh, now I've always been my horror uh, has always come in more of like the the Lovecraft vein. Yeah, um, I got into it. Lovecraft's another one we should mention. Cause... Yeah, I mean, uh, just the the whole concept of I don't want to sort of make this and you know something that, that applies to everything because I certainly don't think it's true, but just the sense of hopelessness that's in so many of his stories. Like, like no matter what you do, no matter what anyone does, like terrible stuff is going to happen and in the meantime it's really going to creep you out and you'll probably be miserable and then you'll die and then bad shit will just happen to other people instead and yeah and you didn't affect any of it and i I think actually that lovecraftian kind of story would play really well today because a lot of people i mean maybe just judging in the past couple weeks um kind of feel like the world is out to get them and that's very much the theme of Lovecraft. You know, Lovecraft was a shut-in and didn't have many friends, and most of his friends were correspondence friends. He was pale. He didn't get out much. He was sickly. And so, kind of, you you take this feeling that the world is out to get you, and you expand it, and you make it really big and really extreme so that instead of it's just well you know the government doesn't care about you really it becomes there's a huge elder god at the center of the universe who's insane and surrounded by a hundred mad dancers and he cares about you so little that he'll reach out and snuff out your life (laughs) yeah and you know whereas in you have a lot of modern fiction where it's like oh like a single person's life is insignificant in the face of all of these, you know, major world affairs that are going on. In Lovecraft, it's very literally like the sum existence of the entire human civilization means absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of this cosmological, you know, web of terrible things happening. Yeah. It's sort of like, take like, you know, like the Carl Sagan view of the earth as like a dot floating in a sunbeam, but then just like, crush that mode of dust that's in the sunbeam and laugh at it, and that's kind of the Lovecraftian view of the universe in a way. Which is funny, because it doesn't, it doesn't really help um, some of the questions that we've had. We're talking mostly about horror, and it's a build-in thing. Mm-hmm. Like, especially with Stephen King, he builds an atmosphere. Lovecraft builds an atmosphere. Um, I don't know, who else was I talking about? Ira Levin builds an atmosphere. Um, and so the question is, well, I'll get right to the, the first couple questions because they're kind of the same question and they're short. Um, first one is from Raron again. Uh, he says, I was wondering if it's possible to write a jump moment. I can imagine well enough how to write suspense, even scary suspense, and I've read things online that make me look over my shoulder at night. The Holder series comes to mind. I have not read those. but No, neither have I actually. Well, uh, accept a recommendation. Uh, he asks, but how could one make the reader actually jump or scream? And... Uh, Stink Dog writes, Hey guys, I was just wondering if either of you have any advice for people who are trying to write something that is truly scary. When I try to write horror, it fails at actually scaring people and I'm at a loss as to how to make it more terrifying. So those are kind of the same question and I thought we'd kind of, talk although about them a little bit. A jump moment and what is truly scary for me are two different things. For me, truly scary is the human race is insignificant and you know nothing you do is going to change that fact. That's the sort of thing that scares me. You remember the Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where Calvin has the hiccups and he tells Hobbes, okay, get rid of the hiccups, scare me. And Hobbes goes, okay, we're killing our environment, we're burning a big hole in the ozone layer, all of our fossil fuels are going to run out in 30 years. Calvin says, no, no, I mean surprise me. Hobbes goes, that doesn't? Boy, you're cynical. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, that's that's classic right there. Our our little moment of we miss Calvin and Hobbes. <sighs> yeah, I'm well, thinking of of jump moments, scary. And actually, this will probably tie in later. But uh, I saw the film Paranormal Activity over the weekend. Scared the crap out of me. 
But I, see, I it's have, easier to do in a movie. It is. And I, and like I was going to say, like in the theater, I have never been as scared in a movie theater as I was seeing this movie. And intellectually, I know it's a movie. I know it's not real. I know it's actors in front of a camera. I know that in two hours, I'm going to be back out you know, in the car on the way home and everything's going to be fine. But when you're caught up in that, when you are caught up in the moment, in the way that I think that a film can do in a way that a, just a written work can't, because the jump moments are so sense dependent, and they're really you, visceral. Yeah, and when you're reading, even if you're reading something that's visceral, it's still you're creating the moment in your head, and you have to sort of do that as you're going along. And I think it's hard to surprise your brain when you're reading. Yeah, I, I, or I, mean, I think it's hard to is, shock your. The brain thing is, in movies, reading. you're controlling the pace at which the story unfolds. Right, and you can. You can use that pacing. You can use music. Uh, I think music is another huge thing, and a lot of people have an appreciation for this in horror films. Um, but the music really builds the tension and then accentuates the jump moments. Right. Um, and actually, that's interesting that you mentioned that because actually in this movie there is no music. It's all done on as if it's just this person's handy cam that he set up in the house to sort of catch whatever's going on. And so it is just the moments of silence punctuated by things just happening. So it's sort of the inverse effect of what you're saying. Right. And with books, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a book that has a jump moment for me, even through all the Stephen King. And mostly, I mean, I have a bad habit. When I turn a page, I kind of flick my eyes to the end of the following page. So I sort of have a framework for what's going on. But I think as you're reading, you're creating those, you're creating the setting in your head, and it's really hard. Be- it's like you can't tickle yourself, right? You know, because you're you're participating. I know a lot of people who are sad about that. <laughs> That's a whole other episode. Um, but because you're creating that moment for yourself, you can't surprise yourself as much. And you're you are pulling in information from the book, but it's not entirely from the book. The way your all of your information is coming from the movie in a movie theater. Yeah, it's like if you were in a movie theater and three seconds before you know the monster jumps out, your friend leans over and says, "Oh, the monster's jumping out in three seconds. It's going to kill this." The but moment. even then, but even then, you can still jump. I mean, I, there's movies where I've seen them two or three times and I still jump. I mean, just as an example, Alien. Yeah, there's like four jump moments in Alien, and I still jump, even though I know what's going to happen. Oh, you know it still makes me jump, even though I know it's going to happen, is Large Marge in Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I That still just will make me nearly piss myself with fear. <laughs> uh, that is an awesome movie and a terrifying moment. It so really the is. The first time I saw that, I freaked out. Oh, it, it, it was... I, at the time, it was the scariest thing. That held the title of scariest thing I'd ever seen for probably over a decade. Oh, my God. It it did. And although, actually, I have, to, I have to admit, I saw Nightmare on Elm Street kind of around that same time. And I finished watching it at, like, 1 in the morning, and I could not go to sleep. I was tired, and I could not make myself go to sleep because I, every time I closed my eyes, I'd be like, oh, my God, can't close my eyes. Yeah, that's the other thing about paranormal activity is it's all about shit that's going on while you're asleep in your own home. It taps into this very primal thing. It's like, yeah, you're just going to be asleep in your bed, and if something's happening, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just like, oh, thanks. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I mean, I can't, I can't think of a book that has a good jump moment. I think Stephen yeah. King would be the place to go. Um, the Shining has a couple, but... Again, I saw the movie first, so I'm not sure how much yeah. of that is me channeling the movie. I think a good way to get just like the punctuation of immediacy is to do a like a paragraph that is nothing more than a single short sentence. Yeah, our old friend, the one sentence paragraph. Yeah, but and, and but, but even do not overuse that because that gets so tiresome. Well, right, but I mean, like if you're gonna have like a one sentence paragraph and it's like a six word sentence. Yeah, I mean that can be very effective if you're doing it right, particularly if it's a big moment or even the big moment of the story or the piece that you're doing. Oh, I will bring up something that I um, something that I read back when Hound of the Baskervilles came out. Uh-huh. Um, the end of one of the chapters is the 
person coming down from the moors to tell Sherlock Holmes about the crime that's been committed. And they've already built up this legendary evil hound that stalks the Baskerville property. And at the end of the chapter, the guy pauses and then says, well, Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a giant hound. And then it cuts, it goes to the next chapter. And what one of the people said in the preface is, the title of that following chapter may be the least read chapter title in all of English literature. <laughs> so it's not really a jump moment, but you can definitely build suspense. Yeah. And then it's a matter of how you pay it off. And if you do it, as you said, in that kind of short one sentence paragraph, you might not be able to get a scream or a jump reaction, but I think it depends on how much you immerse people in the book. Yeah. And again, I mean, it's horror is such a broad term and, you know, like Lovecraft isn't about the jump moments, but I wouldn't say that his stuff is any less horror -y because of it. Although I have to say Lovecraft tries for the jump moments because the one of the devices he uses is to end the stories with, you know, and then, you know, there was this thing and then the last part right. of the sentence is all in italics. Yes. And that's an oft parodied yes. thing, which, which I realize I didn't end my own Lovecraft parody with that. Oh, yeah. But then again, by the time I got to the end of my, I should, I should probably talk about that real quick. Yeah. Go for ahead. the people who Go haven't for read that. It's uh, in uh, Fang 2 along with the, the horror story I wrote, I believe. Yes, Fang 2, which was originally their Halloween issue, and then it got rebranded as number 2, I believe. I just want to make sure I have the number right in my head. I think it's... Yes, because... I don't remember. Fang... My story in it is called Plays Well with Others, so if the collection has that story in it, then you've got the right one. Right, yeah, no, this is uh, The Fox and the Unspeakable Horror, which right there from the, the name, I'm going for the whole Lovecraft mystique. And uh, Which worked really well. I was actually really happy with how it came out, especially because I wanted to evoke what was going on, but also make it obviously obviously a parody, but a parody that is from somebody who enjoys the source material and isn't just trying to take the piss out of it. All right. And uh, so, yeah, I wrote the story, and then I got to the end, and then Kyle made me put tentacle sex in it. Because, yeah, because <laughs> well, you you got it was tentacle tentacle creature undressing a fox. I mean, how do you not go to tentacle sex from there? You know, my mind doesn't normally go to tentacle sex. It does now after I wrote it. <laughs> which I mean, okay, I'll I'll blame you for that minor degree of sanity loss that you caused me. I'll fully accept that. Yeah. I've already talked about my tentacle story, which I don't know where that came from. I don't remember if that was before or after that one. Uh, I believe yours might have been before. I think maybe it was Tar and Fox's animations. Maybe that's what did it. Oh, you don't know, get distracted. Whatever about I was about right to now. say just went right out my other ear as I started playing up those old DivX movies in my head. <laughs> See the water creature that was that was kind of horror. That, that was uh, yeah, that was the one. I, that was one of the three I was thinking of actually. Yeah. I'm, anyway, I'm a bad why otter. Don't we, why Otters don't we... are in the water. I don't want horrible things happening there. Well, it's true. Like water creature tentacle sex blowjobs and. You know, actually, that's the one part about tentacle sex that never quite sat well with me. Is like, you invariably have the one tentacle that's like trying to suck the guy off. It's like, why would a tentacle have a mouth? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, maybe it's like a lamprey. That'd be a horror story. Oh, oh God. Ah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know way too much about biology to, for that to be anything but just <laughs> grotesque and horrible. Uh, go back, go back to the water creature and read your letter. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to go back to the happy Hirosaki's place. Happy place. It's up in the <laughs> it's up in the mountains of of Iwate Prefecture, to the west of Morioka, where there's hot springs where the otter boys all play, and where the androgynous robot fox attendants have no teeth in their mouths. Well, I mean, if there's any place you're going to get good androgynous robot foxes, it's going to be Japan. <laughs> that actually is very true. 
All right, read on. You know, over the last couple of months of podcasting, we keep on coming up with the missing pieces of the puzzle to this story I'm eventually just going to have to write, you realize. I hope so. I don't think that Pyro is picking up on it, so I think it falls to me. Androgynous robot foxes in a temple high in the mountains of Japan. I will take one for the team. And now I'm going to move on to my, my letter. That's... Please do. So I tried to do the, the not cast paper ruffle and I failed miserably. Uh, it's because we're not not cast. <sighs> no, we're still... we'll, have to, we'll have to ask them for some tips when uh, we run into those guys. How do you do the paper ruffle? Damn it. <laughs> Just read. So this, is, this is from Candrel again. It says, Afternoon, guys. Which I'm going to guess is when it was when he wrote it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My mind was just thinking about something else. Now I've embarrassed us all. Wow, you actually got Kit to stand up for that. I'm making him leave the room. Oh. <sighs> okay. Dead air is bad air. I've written a bit of horror in my time and read even more, and I found that there's three concrete rules that have invariably succeeded for me. I figure I'd pass them on to you and your listeners, who you choose to share. So, point the first. Nothing is scarier than the familiar. Most people who read books are so inured to the strange and otherworldly that they're just not afraid of aliens from Mars anymore. Instead, it's the things that they have personal experience with that can become creepy. This is especially the case with things that emerge from people's childhoods. Empty playgrounds, twisted stuffed animals and dolls, haunted suburbia. These are all the familiar trappings that work best to set a horror scene. And I, I think I'm gonna, that's... I'm going to jump in a little bit and say yeah. it's, not just the, it's not just the familiar, but sort of the perversion of the familiar. Right. And the perversion of the innocence. Right. Because, you know, where he mentions childhood stuff. Like clowns. Oh my god, clowns are terrifying if you... Well, you know, I don't, I don't think they are so much anymore because I, we've all come to regard them as creatures of horror. Well, I, but I, I, I still I, think I there's go, an instinctual level. I will go back to The that. Shining and say the two little girls in the hallway. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, and, and actually, I think that the creepy child archetype is never not going to be scary. They, they do that I, in a lot of things, and it's just... Or it's, it's always at least unsettling. It is it is unsettling. I think when they have the child being really aware that they're evil, it's less so. Yeah, no, it's and I think that again with the corruption of innocence, like uh there's this two part episode of Doctor Who where you have like this little child with like a gas mask fused to his face looking for his mummy and he just keeps like going around asking people if if they're his mommy, and it's terrifying because it's just this like little like seven year old boy with a gas mask on his face, and like he doesn't know any better, and it's just really creepy. Wow. Yeah. There's there's That's actually it. a fair bit of a horror element to some of the Doctor Who stories, but I won't. Uh, I'll I'll throw that over to Fuzzwolf. Yeah, I was going to say you know, and Fuzzwolf should sit down and talk about Doctor Who one episode. Yeah, well, we've talked about Doctor Who in person at cons before, but... Uh, anyway, go on. That was on. number one. So, uh, point the second. The horror isn't in the action, it's in the details. The fact that a psycho just stabbed your protagonist can be scary in theory, but it's the way and length to which it's described that really brings out the squeamish and teeth-chattering chills to your reader's spines. And I think that this is something that I briefly touched on earlier about doing just like a quick short one sentence paragraph of just sort of the very matter of fact lack of detail can be a bit shocking depending on how you do it. Yeah. And again, I mean, I, I go back to balance like everything else. It's a question of how much detail you want to put in and putting in the right detail so that the reader can build up the picture for themselves. Yeah. And I think often a lot of it is the amount of detail should be possibly in contrast to how much detail you're normally putting in the story. If the story itself tends to be sparse on detail, by suddenly switching to more detail, you're catching attention, and vice versa. Right, right. Yeah. And three, there's no fear without hope. Even if your hero's darkest hour, even in your hero's darkest hour, there's always some glimmer of hope. 
The moment you extinguish that, the story is over because the readers will simply accept the inevitable. The story becomes a prolonged ending. At all times, there must be a chance, no matter how slim, that there's an escape from the personal hell you've dropped your characters into. To which Hirosaki Sun interjects, unless you're reading Lovecraft, in which case you know, no, there is no hope, and there is no hope for success. But the characters don't know that. <laughs> that the and they don't. in the yes. Lovecraft stories always struggle. That's true. And that's what makes like them interesting. Like flies on flypaper. Yes. Or uh, like a knot stuck in a fox. That much analogy less... works better in my head. Yeah, I was going to say, that's not really scary or horrific at all. No. It is distracting, but... Yeah. Oh, damn, I'm bad at this tonight. <laughs> I blame the wine. I just blame the fact that I'm a pervert. Well, that's why we're sitting here doing this podcast. I just think you should devote more of the energy to uh, writing down your perversions instead of distracting your co-host and tech-savvy wolf with them. And potentially listeners. But yes, uh, to address his point here about there being hope. Alright, so a lot of people rag on me for my stories being kind of negative. But again, I think that as you were saying, the characters have to strive and struggle. And that's true in the face of a normal conflict. That's true in the face of a horror-based conflict. Where the tension comes from not knowing. The reader needs to feel that there's something at stake. And that there's an uncertainty on how something's going to end. Right, exactly. Which is... I was going to say, that's basic to pretty much any story. It's, right. So the whole thing with horror is, again, you know, we're taking... The reader's been introduced to this extreme world where, uh, you know, horrible things happen that are beyond the normal realm of experience. And the reader has to believe that the character's not going to get completely sucked into it. Right. Or in in some cases, you know, you want to see the character fail. And that's a legitimate way of doing things, too. Like, uh, I think that's a lot truer in like, vignette or sort of, like, brief horror anthology stuff where you're watching somebody who's obviously a complete jerk and playing with forces beyond his control and you're just waiting for his uppance to come. Right. And... <laughs> it's, uh... Because it's hard to sustain that. Yeah. Um, that's the... That is much more of a, a short moment. Um, I will say that... No, uh, this isn't really relevant. I'll talk about it a bit later. Um, but yeah, in closing, just to finish up what he says, he says, over the years that I've been writing, I've begun to notice that I'm hardly the first to follow these three laws. The best of Hollywood's horror genre uses the same formula here. Think back to your favorite horror movies and you'll see that all three of the rules above are almost universally observed, at least, if you think of rule two as the attention paid to the details in the real horror scenes. And actually, since the last horror movie I saw was just three days ago when I saw... Uh, paranormal activity uh, yeah a lot of that is due to the fact that you know you have this very mundane you know basic sort of situation like it's your own home you know while you're asleep you know by itself that wouldn't normally be scary until you make it scary and then suddenly it's something that everyone can identify with All right and again with the rosemary's baby and stepford wives examples the horror comes from the fact that it's the person close to you, you're supposed to be in this, in a marriage, which is supposed to be a relationship of trust, and it's the fact that the person closest to you is betraying that trust, that's where the horror comes from. That also works in uh, steamy romance stories, too. Uh, it does. Um, and actually, the story... And I didn't mean that to be smarmy, I actually meant that. The Yeah, I'm trying to think of what I could say about my story... In Fang, because I haven't written much horror myself. I guess the Garden of Unearthly Delights kind of qualifies as horror. Which means Uh, that all of our tentacle sex stories would be horror. It's... uh, No, I I think that's that's horror. I mean, actually, science fiction and horror uh, match pretty well. Yeah. Like, they're all put together. You know, like, that sort of thing. Twilight Zone. Yeah. Um, we should mention, too, that uh, there's a there's an anthology out 
that uh, Will Sanborn put out last year called Alone in the Dark. Yeah. It's a very beefy anthology, too. There's several which dozen has a, stories in which it. Which has a ton of stories in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've read a couple of them. Yeah. I have a They're copy. I haven't read the whole thing. I've read maybe about a quarter of it. Yeah. Um, I so we got just at work. And actually, now that it's the season for Halloween again, I should probably go back to it. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to read the sort of the gist of this last question that we got and we're, uh, we're getting the five minute sign from Kit. So this one is from Trundane and he gives an example of a story he was reading that built up a great, uh, suspense feeling of suspense in him. And he asks, what are your favorite ways to build suspense or anxiety in a scene so that when the big boo happens, if it happens, it has the greatest impact? And conversely, do you think there are times when that tension should be maintained and never quite have a sense of resolution? That feels a bit Hitchcockian, so I'll cheat and make this a separate question. Can you name off any examples of the tension never quite being resolved, where the reader is left with this lingering sense of, but wait, what was the cause? See, when I hear the question, you know, or the notion of, building up tension and letting it build and then not resolving it. I just think of blue balling. Basically your story pressure. Yeah. Um, and there is, you know, there, there's a lot of stylistic parallels between horror and erotica. It's erotica is really the kind of extreme of romance. It's right. taken romance and relationship issues and put them into the sexual arena where they're all magnified and they're very concrete and they're very physical. So it's sort of taken a lot of these emotional problems and put them into a physical arena where we can look at them in kind of a different way. Right. And it's on a base level that people can just innately identify with. So you're not to overextend the analogy, but you're really reaching your audience on an even playing field. Right. And it's a, a but it is it's very visceral in the same way that horror is. Right. And you know where we can talk all highfalutin intellectually about horror being a way to magnify and therefore cope with societal problems on a bigger scale. You know, the reason people like horror is because it's scary. Right. And people reason pe- blah, the reason people like erotica is because it's hot. So or you know if, if they're uh, getting sexed up by tentacles it's both. Yeah can be the um so the favorite favorite ways to build up suspense i mean what we try to do with all of our writing is immerse the reader in the world right and the way to build up suspense is to build up expectations in the reader as far as what's happening and you can do that in a number of ways if you're using an established archetype or type of story the reader has certain expectations about what's coming so if you're writing a horror story and one of the characters disappears, the reader's already got the expectation that they're going to wind up dead at some point, and that one of the characters searching around is going to find the dead body, or part of the dead body, or the undead, or something. Mm -hmm. And so you can play with that expectation and kind of string the reader along, give them little clues. Um, You can also set up the expectations in your story if you want to set them up for something else. Um, say we're expecting a visit from the Johnsons down the road. And then every time the doorbell rings, you think, oh, it's, you know, they're expecting visitors, but then it's something else. Mm -hmm. So, and that's basically my thoughts on on building up. And I think that... Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the difference would be when you're building up suspense, it's that something you're building up the expectation that something bad is going to happen. Right. But, and about building up suspense, there's again, you can either do this externally or internally to the characters. You can have it, you know, be sort of the mental buildup of what's going on. You know, either you, you can do this in third person or first person about, you know, what's actually happening, like what's actually going through the character's mind you know, building up the suspense there and making it a very mental, psychological thing. Or you can, you know, externalize it, and that's much easier to do in third person than first person just because of the filters where you're giving, you're building up suspense in the reader's mind but not the character's mind. And depending right. on what you're trying to do, either of those can be legitimate. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's just 
good storytelling either way. Yeah. And it all and storytelling is all about playing with reader expectations as well. Yeah. And I think that on the basic storytelling level, I think that building up the tension needed for horror suspense isn't that much different than building up the tension that you would for anything else you'd need to build tension for. Right. You'd, you'd um, use the same you know techniques and methods. As far as leaving it unresolved, I think you can do that in cases where you're writing about a character. Right. And the character kind of escapes from the situation with his story complete. But Salem's Lot comes to mind. Oh, yeah. That's a good example, actually. Where the character goes through his story and gets out, but the whole horror issue is never resolved. A lot of Lovecraft is that way, too, right. where the character finishes the story and you're like, but the Shoggoths were still down <laughs> under the temple of, yeah. you know, and they're going to eat the town. Well, who cares? Because the main character's in a sanitarium now. Now I just like uh, I want to you speechless without even trying. No, I'm I'm leaving a pause for Kit to put in the uh, Price is Right failure trombone. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> that one, yes. Now, um, no, when you mentioned, I was trying to think of more specific Lovecraft examples, but it's probably not worth it since I'm not sure how in depth a lot of our listener base is with. It's cause... interesting. There's not many. There's yeah. not like a real archetypal Lovecraft story. It's more of the body of work. Yeah. Well, because it very much is, you know, the mythos. I mean, right. that's what it is. And, and actually, a lot of it wasn't even just him. I mean, between... I was going to make a joke earlier about how I'm the August Darleth to your H.P. Lovecraft <laughs> when you're talking about, like, friends and correspondence. You're so much better than August Darleth. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, but... Oh, the, the... There were worse knockoffs that added to the Cthulhu mythos than August Derleth, though. Well, I don't there doubt. Were... I don't doubt that. All I'm saying is, I've read some August Derleth stories where you know we talked about the whole Lovecraft device of uh-huh. italicizing the punch at the end of the story. And I've read some August Derleth stories where he just italicized the whole last paragraph of his story, which kind of took away from the impact of it. You know, as far as you know, from an editing standpoint, I'm wondering how that ever got by, and that. It was a different time back then, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was like 1957, 58. <laughs> <laughs> it was way earlier than that, though. <laughs> listeners, please, we're, we're joking, listeners. That's where we, we definitely do not think that August Derleth was writing stories in the 60s. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just an in-joke reference. Yes, and it, and it works because now I'm red-faced and giggling, which <laughs> it has become a regular thing in the last four episodes of this. Do a YouTube search on N A S S A and you'll find it. Yeah. It's but, not horror, so we're not going to say any more about right. it. Right. It's 10 minutes of your life that you'll not regret spending, I hope. Um, but anyway, so I guess the the one thing we didn't really answer, we didn't kind of come to a conclusion on the jump moment. And I just think maybe it's one of those things that you can't really do in writing the way you yeah. can in movies. Or if, if we, you guys have. Any examples of books that have made you jump, write in with them, and we will mention them on the air. And if we think of any, we'll talk about them. But I can't, I can't think of one that's made me jump even as much as kind of, as like the worst horror movie. Yeah, and I think that that might be in part due to it's not what we write, and it's not a bulk of what we read. Yeah, or maybe it's just a you know a fact of the medium that it's just hard to do without the multi sensory thing of a movie. Yeah. But anyway, hopefully y'all have a good Halloween. And for you aspiring horror writers out there, we look forward to seeing your next works. And hopefully this has helped a little bit. We're looking forward to seeing uh, what sort of follows we get. Yeah, I am too. And maybe for uh, next year, I think it's a little late for us to start writing more horror stories now. But um, check out the Will Sanborn book, Alone in the Dark. Check out Fang Volume, whatever it is, Two. Two, with the horror stories in it. And... If I was going to be writing a horror story right now, it would be, this is what's going on at my day job right now. <laughs> this is my life. Will his mind crack? You really could write a Lovecraftian story where your your employers are elder gods who I was, are insane. And... I was just thinking that. <laughs> well, well, we'll look forward to that if it happens. Yeah. But until then, happy Halloween, y'all. 
And uh, I'm Kyle Gold. I am Cam Hirasaki. Send your uh, emails to unsheathedpodcast at gmail.com. Check us out, unsheathed at FA. Um, is that it? Oh, yeah, and go to iTunes and vote for us and tell the people who cruise iTunes how good they are. Thank you. Love us. Worship us. Devote your love and, and attention to us. After tonight, fear us. Ha <laughs> ha.